My aim for this video is to provide viewers with a basic grounding in ion channel electrophysiology, to simplify some of the terminology and help with interpreting and appreciating published data on ion channel properties and function. Ion channel currents are measured using a range of voltage clamp techniques. In case you haven't seen my video on the methods used to study ion channels, I will begin with a brief overview of what voltage clamp is. I will then explain typical voltage protocols that are used to elicit ion channel currents and how they are measured. Features of sodium, potassium and calcium channel currents will be discussed and the concept of ion channel rectification will be explained. Voltage clamp is an electrophysiological technique that is used to measure the ionic currents that flow across a cell's membrane under conditions that stop the membrane potential from changing in response to those currents. The basic principles are illustrated here for a two electrode system. A cell bathed in physiological solution is impaled with a fine glass microelectrode containing an electrolyte and connected to an amplifier by silver wire. Another wire connects the amplifier to the physiological solution and it acts as the reference point against which changes in voltage or current across the cell membrane are measured. The output of the amplifier measures the membrane potential and is fed into a second amplifier. It compares the measured membrane potential with a reference voltage at which the membrane is to be clamped. Its output is proportional to the difference between the two values. So, when the membrane potential equals the reference voltage, the output is zero. When ion channels open and pass current, it induces the membrane potential to change, causing the amplifier to emit current to bring the difference back to zero. Its output current is fed back into the cell via a second electrode to recover the membrane potential to the reference value. This happens instantaneously, so the membrane voltage is effectively clamped at the reference level. The current injected into the cell is equal in magnitude but opposite in direction to the currents flowing through open ion channels. So this is the current recorded in voltage clamp experiments. The same principles apply in single electrode voltage clamp and patch clamp experiments, except that the voltage clamp is achieved with a single electrode. Voltage clamp experiments can be performed in a variety of ways. In this experiment, membrane currents were recorded from a voltage clamp neuronal cell using the whole cell configuration of the patch clamp technique. Essentially, that means that the interior of the micropipette connects directly with the interior of the cell and records the current flowing through all of the open ion channels in the entire cell membrane. The experiment starts by clamping the membrane potential at minus 60 millivolts, where most voltage gated ion channels are closed. So no current is recorded. A step depolarization is then applied and repeated at a fixed interval, increasing the amplitude of the depolarization each time. When the voltage step reaches the level at which ion channels begin to activate, Currents are induced with amplitudes and kinetics that reflect the ion channels that give rise to them. Here you can identify two types of voltage gated current. One activates quickly with downward deflections, indicating inward current or inward movement of positive ions. These currents are caused by sodium channels opening. The other appears slightly delayed and deflects upwards, indicating outward current or outward flux of positive ions. These currents are due to potassium channels opening. There is no reason for drawing inward currents in the downwards direction and outward currents upwards, except that it has become the convention. By having this convention, anyone can immediately tell the direction of current from how it is plotted. Some ion channels are activated by neurotransmitters rather than voltage, although the membrane potential can affect the currents. 
This is the case with ligand gated ion channels. They are studied by applying a neurotransmitter to the cell while the voltage is clamped at a particular level. In this example, acetylcholine was applied to a cell clamped at plus 30 millivolts. Current increased as acetylcholine hit its receptors, then declined as the receptors desensitized. Drug application was repeated at different clamped membrane potentials, revealing the voltage dependence of the currents induced by acetylcholine. Patch clamping allows us to record the current flowing through an individual ion channel in a patch of membrane isolated at the tip of a micropipette. Think about it, it's the flux through a single protein molecule seen in real time. This is a typical record of current flowing through a single channel. When the channel is closed, the current is zero. During continuous recording, the channels flip back and forth between the closed and open states. This is seen as brief pulses of current that last so long as the channel is open. The currents always go to the same level when the channel is open. That level depends on the rate of flow of ions through the open channel or the channel conductance. I will now take you through a typical voltage clamp experiment designed to measure sodium currents, in this case using whole cell recording. The lower trace is of membrane potential and the upper trace is the current recorded at that membrane potential. At the start of the experiment, the membrane potential is clamped at minus 70 millivolts to keep the channels closed. The current recorded is therefore zero. After a few milliseconds, the membrane is depolarized to minus 60 millivolts. That is not sufficiently depolarized to open channels, so there is little change in the current record. But if you keep increasing the amplitude of the voltage step, eventually you start to activate currents. In this case, they are inward currents as sodium ions enter the cell flowing down their electrochemical gradient. The current reaches a peak and then declines due to channel inactivation. There is a gap of several seconds between each voltage step during which the channels recover. With increasing voltage steps, the current amplitude increases because more ion channels are open. To investigate the voltage dependence of channel opening, we draw a current voltage curve. This is obtained by measuring the peak amplitude of the current activated by each voltage step and plotting it as a function of the voltage at which it was activated. The points are then connected to show the relationship between current and voltage. The same approach is taken to record voltage-gated potassium currents. Again, there is no current at minus 70 millivolts because voltage-gated potassium channels do not open at that voltage. But as the size of the voltage step increases, gradually increasing currents are activated. This time, they don't show inactivation within the time scale of the voltage steps. The current amplitudes are then measured and plotted as a function of the voltage at which they were activated. This reveals a typical current voltage relationship for an outwardly rectifying potassium channel. Note that at the onset of the voltage step, there's often a large, rapid and transient event in current records. That is due to charging of the cell membrane and does not relate to ion channel activity. So if you see this in figures when you're reading papers, you can mostly ignore it. Potassium channels are a large, diverse group of proteins. They are encoded by many different genes, and the function channel is often made up of multiple subunits. This impacts on the behaviour of currents recorded from potassium channels, which can vary substantially. These traces typify current waveforms recorded from the main pore forming alpha subunits KV1.1 to KV1.6, which make up some of these diverse channels. All are activated by depolarization. Here, a voltage step from minus 100 to 0 millivolts. But they show different rates of activation and inactivation. 
The main function of potassium channels is to counteract membrane depolarization. For example, during an action potential, during repeated action potential firing, or to prevent an action potential from firing. A potassium channel that activates quickly can stop a depolarizing stimulus from reaching threshold and triggering an action potential. But if its inactivation is fast, such as in KV1.4, it quickly loses its ability to counteract depolarization during sustained or repetitive activity. On the other hand, a slowly inactivating channel, such as KV1.1 or KV1.6, will continue to promote repolarization during periods of prolonged or repetitive stimulation. In this way, it can limit the length of a burst of action potentials. There are many more potassium current waveforms and cells often express multiple types of potassium channel. They therefore play important roles in shaping the membrane electrical activity to suit the functions of different cell types. Another group of voltage gated ion channels is the calcium channels, which are important for controlling the flux of calcium ions into cells. The current voltage relationships for three different calcium channel alpha subunits are shown here. To ease comparison, the y-axis is plotted as the normalised current or the ratio of current amplitude to the maximum amplitude measured for each channel. As calcium currents are always inward, the amplitudes are plotted with an inverted y-axis to indicate downward currents. As a cell depolarises, inward current increases due to channels opening. The current amplitude reaches a peak when the maximum level of current activation is achieved. As the membrane depolarizes further, current amplitude starts to decline again because the membrane potential is approaching the equilibrium or Nernst potential for calcium and the driving force for ion flow is reduced. Where the current through open channels is zero, that is the reversal potential for the ions flowing through the channel. If the only ions passing through the channel are calcium, this should equal the Nernst potential for calcium. Although these current voltage plots were all constructed for calcium channels, they are clearly different. Most notable is the leftward shift in the relationship for CAV 3.1, indicating that it has a lower voltage threshold for activation. That enables it to mediate depolarization towards a cell's threshold for generating an action potential, such as in pacemaker cells of the heart. It can also mediate calcium influx at rest in cells with a resting potential more positive than minus 60 millivolts. A larger depolarization is needed to activate CAV1 channels, enabling them to mediate calcium influx during an action potential but not at rest or between action potentials. You should now have a good idea of the basic experimental approach to voltage clamping, how to study voltage dependent ion channels and what to expect of the properties. Things will now get a bit more complicated as we consider the property of rectification. Potassium currents like these, which you have already seen, are examples of outwardly rectifying currents. That means that the ion channels prefer to pass outward current and not inward current. The reason they don't pass inward current is that the channels only open above around minus 50 millivolts, where the electrochemical driving force directs potassium ions out of the cell. Voltage gated ion channels are generally closed at membrane potentials where the driving force might give rise to inward current. Some potassium channels, namely the KIR family, can pass inward current and they are known as inward rectifiers. These currents were recorded from inward rectifier potassium channels using a similar protocol to the records on the left. In this case, the currents activated by depolarizing voltage steps are very small. Now look what happens if the voltage steps go in the other direction and hyperpolarize the cell below the reversal or Nernst potential for potassium. Large currents are now seen moving in the inward direction. 
This plot compares the current voltage relationships for an outward and an inwardly rectifying potassium channel. With the outward rectifier, there is no current recorded at potentials negative to the potassium equilibrium potential, or EK, and an increasingly outward current appears as the cell is depolarised. The inward current generated by the inward rectifier shows a linear relationship between current and voltage at potentials below the potassium equilibrium potential. That is what you would predict if the ion channel was voltage independent and activated to the same extent at all these voltages. In other words, as the voltage changes, the electrical driving force on the ion changes, resulting in a change in flow that is unrelated to a change in channel activation. But a channel that activates independently of membrane potential should show the same linear current voltage relationship at all potentials passing through zero current at the Nernst potential for potassium. Instead, the current voltage relationship diverges from linearity, bending to the right as depolarization increases. The reason is that as the membrane becomes more positive, charged molecules in the cytosol are attracted to binding sites at the mouth of the channel where they bind and block ion flow. The main culprits are magnesium ions and polyamines. The current voltage relationship for an inward rectifier has important consequences for cell activity. Firstly, these channels are often open at the resting membrane potential, so they mediate potassium efflux at the resting potential and contribute to the resting membrane potential. But potassium efflux diminishes during an action potential, so they have a relatively minor role in these events. Importantly, inward rectifiers can respond rapidly to small depolarizations or hyperpolarizations around the resting potential of cells like neurons and cardiac myocytes to counteract the change. They therefore have an important stabilizing effect on the resting membrane potential in these cells. You should now have a good grasp of some of the basic concepts in ion channel physiology. I hope you found the video as helpful and informative as I intended. And thank you for watching.